If you don't have your Bibles, I think we can follow along on the uh, overhead over there. Isaiah chapter 40. I'm going to read the whole chapter and then we'll get into the Word of God this morning. So, Isaiah chapter 40, from verse 1 to the end. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended and that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The voice said, cry out. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades because the breath of the Lord blows upon it and surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem. You who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up and do not be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord shall come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm. He shall carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord? Or as his counselor has taught him, with whom did he take counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket, and they are counted as small dust on the scales. Look, he lifts up the isles as a very little thing, and Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor its beasts sufficient for a bird offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. To whom then will you liken God? And what likeness will you compare to him? The workman molds an image, the goldsmith overspreads it with gold, and the silversmith casts silver chains. Whoever is too impoverished for such a contribution chooses a tree that will not rot. He seeks for himself a skillful workman to prepare a carved image that will not totter. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing, and he make, makes the judges of the earth useless. Scarcely shall they be planted, scarcely shall they be sown, scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth, when he will also blow on them and they will wither and the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. To whom then will you liken me, or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number, who calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. None is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God? Have you not heard, have you not known the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Next week we're going to be starting a series that I believe is crucial and important for all of us. And the series is how to live victoriously in a godless society. How to deal with the secular culture that is around us. 
a culture that is founded on principles and on statutes that totally defy scripture? And how do you live victoriously and how do you rise above all of that? How do you prevent yourself from being intimidated by the godlessness and the unbelief that is all around us? And uh, we're going to be studying the book of Daniel. And through the book of Daniel, we're going to find out how you can prosper and thrive as a righteous man or a righteous woman, even in the midst of ungodliness, and you can be promoted to high levels and have influence on the world around you. But my dilemma was, is how do I connect that with what we've been talking about in the last three weeks? The book of Daniel is a story about four boys who were exiled to Babylon from Judea and how they were raised to prominence under Nebuchadnezzar and under Belshazzar and under Darius, the king of the Medes and Persians, and then finally under Cyrus. And how the Lord used them to influence these men and to, to bring glory to God in the midst of one of the most godless societies that has ever existed. Great society, a tremendous civilization, but did not honor the God of Israel. God brought honor to himself through those four boys. How do you connect that now to what we've been talking about, which is the hurts that we carry? And this passage of scripture, Isaiah 40, is the bridge, the connection between talking about our hurts and talking about overcoming the culture around us, the godless culture around us. This is the bridge between the two. Because this particular passage of scripture was written to the Jews who were exiled in Babylon. And so it connects Daniel to what we've been talking about in the last three weeks. Not everybody in Israel was corrupt. Not everybody in Israel worshipped idols. There were many faithful people. I know Daniel and his four friends were faithful. I can assume from that that there were other people who worshipped the God of Israel. But nevertheless, the Lord allowed that his people would be overrun by the Babylonians and everybody taken into exile. He had had prophets go to the people of Israel and tell them when Nebuchadnezzar comes in with his armies, don't resist him, or you will be put to death by the sword. And so those who obeyed the prophet lived and were taken into captivity, but those who resisted were struck down. But I want you to imagine that you are one of those faithful Israelites who has been serving God all of your life. You know that the nation has not been as faithful as you have been. You know that you've had corrupt kings up until the very last one, Zedekiah. And you know that your king has been taken to Babylon in chains, in fact with a hook around his chin and a hook in his nose and his sons killed before his very eyes. You know that the glory of God has departed from the nation and here you are now in exile in Babylon and you don't know what to do. Everything that you've worked for is lost. Everything that you've believed is shattered. Your faith has been shaken. And there are three things that are going around amongst the people of Israel that are really disturbing you. Number one, the people of Israel wondered, has God been defeated? Has the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob finally met his match? The second thing that was going around was, are the gods of Babylon greater than the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Because if he has been defeated by Babylon, maybe their gods are greater than our God. And then finally there was one personal thing going around, I think that emanated from those two things, does God no longer care about his people? I can understand that and I can relate to that. I don't know if sometimes you felt overwhelmed. Perhaps you have been asking the same questions in your life because of the adversity that you face. It's not easy to be a Christian. But it's particularly not easy to be a Christian in the city of Montreal and in the province of Quebec. Because the Christian network in the province of Quebec is very small. In fact, 0.03% of the population are born again. You won't find that anywhere in North America. And Quebec is considered the spiritual desert of North America. So if you're going to be a Christian here, you are going to be challenged on every side. 
Not only will you be challenged by the secularism of the society around you, but you're going to be challenged again by the weakness of the Christian network that exists in this city. The churches are not getting together as they should. And so local churches then are left basically alone to fend against the enemy and the world and try to spread the gospel within and out of their local church and sometimes that can be overwhelming. I know that in this church that we are about a hundred and some odd people and we established a, a very clear and a very high vision. And because our core group is limited, because we have a core group of about 50 or 60 people, the burden of carrying out that vision rests on very few. And because you have jobs and you have lives outside of the church, this can become very difficult. Well, add to that adversity, going through a hard time, add to that unemployment, add to that conflict in marriage, add to that some of the hurts that we've been talking about over the last three weeks, add to that the responsibility of advancing the kingdom of God and you will find yourself sometimes depressed, you will find yourself sometimes overwhelmed, you will find yourself sometimes tired and there will be times when you'll be seeking God for answers and the answers are not coming because you are put in such a difficult situation as the Jews were. They were exiled in a foreign land, that's a difficult situation and they were usurped and, and torn up from their roots and taken into a strange land to start all over again. That would be difficult. So you may find yourself asking the same questions. You may not be saying, is God defeated? But you may be saying, am I defeated? I've tried everything that I know and nothing is working. Is not my God sovereign over all things? And if that is the case, and if I believe that with all my heart, why is it then that I am living in defeat? You'd be asking the same questions that the, Israels, the Israelites asked when they were exiled to Babylon. Why am I defeated? Secondly, isn't God greater than the forces that are in my culture? Should I uh, be intimidated by the unbelief that is around me? Uh, should I be scared to stand up for Jesus in the face of a godless society? Isn't it true, and I've heard it said by many preachers, that me plus the Holy Spirit is a majority? And if that is the case, then why do I feel so weak? Why do I feel scared? And why do I feel timid uh, 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 based on the world that is around me? Why is it that the godlessness and the unbelief and the, and, the, and the exaltation of science and philosophy over the Word of God has, has made me so timid that I can't even stand up, I can't even at work give a testimony. Why am I so weak? You may have asked that question. And you may have asked even a more basic question is, if answers are not coming and things are not working in my life, then maybe God doesn't care about me. Where is the love and care of the shepherd of Israel in my life? That's what happens when you are facing adversity. And sometimes the Lord allows adversity to be able to make a point about himself. And this is what had happened to the Israelites. And so this message, Isaiah chapter 40, were given, was given to people who were asking those questions and who were exiled to Babylon as we're going to study further in the book of Daniel. Here's what the Lord said to them. Comfort, yes, comfort my, spe my people, says your God. Comfort my people, speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received double from the Lord's hand, double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low, the crooked place Places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The Lord's answer to you in the midst of difficult questions is that God is on his way. You don't have to run to him. He is running to you. And this particular passage of scripture in verse 3 was spoken by John the Baptist that was applied to him directly to say to you to me that the answer that God has for these difficult questions is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is coming to you in the form of a man. He will become one of you and he will 
reveal the kingdom of God to you and die on the cross and rise from the dead and all of the answers that you're looking for are coming from him. That was the promise that was given to Israel. The thing is that Israel never realized their promise because the Messiah Jesus did not come. But he has come for you. He are on this side of the cross. Not before the cross but after the cross. So if you feel defeated, if you feel God that, that you are weak, if you feel that God no longer cares about you, the Lord would say to you, I am coming to you and I am going to minister to you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will connect with you in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the answer. And when God comes, his, interve his intervention will make everything right. The crooked places shall be made straight. The rough places shall be made smooth, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. So not, you're not going to be in the situ situation that you are in for very long. God is going to do something about it. And he will straighten things out. That's what the Lord was saying to the people. Intervention, And he says the same thing to you. And listen to it very carefully. The voice, that is the voice of the Lord, said, cry out. He said, what shall I cry? That all flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are like grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. What does he mean? mean by that? He means that if you are going through something and if you are experiencing adversity, your answers are not going to be found in men. Your answers are not going to be found in human flesh because human flesh will fail you. Your answers will be found in the Word of God. Strength, the strength that you are looking for, will be found in the Word of God. So the Lord reminds us in these scripture verses that all flesh, all men are like grass. They are feeble, they are weak, they are decaying and they are dying just like we are. Their wisdom is limited, their, their insight is finite, they can only go so far. And they may be able, be able to help you to a certain degree, but they won't be able to help you completely. They won't be able to close all the books and tie all the loose ends because they don't have the wisdom that is necessary to pull you out of the situation. The only way that you will come out of the situation that you are facing now is through the indestructible, infallible Word of God. That is where your answers are. Now, you know, that's very important because when you are discouraged and when you are down, your conceptions of God can really be twisted. I know that I've discovered in my life that the conceptions that I have about the character of God when I'm down, when I'm discouraged, when I'm tired, when I'm sick, when I'm defeated are not true. I may be tired and think that God is also tired. I may be sick and feel that God will never heal me. I may be in a, in a situation where I'm unemployed and I may feel that God will never find me a job. And by virtue of the challenge that I am facing, fatigue and the frustration that I carry day after day, I may think about, I may think about the Lord in a way that is not true. But the Word of God clears out all the misconceptions. You need to understand that when you are tired and when you are defeated and when you are down, and when you are lonely and when you are discouraged you can project those feelings of discouragement onto God you may project what you are feeling to cause you to believe certain untruths about the Lord that perhaps he's not faithful that perhaps he will not come through for you that perhaps his promise applies to somebody else but not to you nothing could be further from the truth the word of God erases all doubt and confusion that you may be carrying because you've been in the situation for a long time. And the Word of God builds faith, which is a necessity before God moves. There has to be faith. And so the Word of God builds faith, and when faith is built, God begins to move. He never moves apart from His Word. But what He wants to teach you is that His Word is greater than your circumstances. His Word is greater than what you see, feel, smell, taste, and touch. His his word is greater than any advice or any counsel that any human being could give you. His word is from everlasting to everlasting and it is sure and certain and a firm foundation.
foundation under your feet. You want to get out of the pit that you're, sw that you're wallowing in? Go to the Word of God and you'll find yourself lifted up and on the outside and standing on a solid rock through His Word. Now, having said that, the, the Word of God establishes right away in this same passage of Scripture. And I'm so glad it does. That first and foremost, before we think about anything else, we have to understand that God does care about us. So here's the Lord telling us that you've got problems, go to, your, go to the Word of God. Go to the Word of God in this same passage. But as you go to the Word of God, understand the very first and most important thing that, I, that the Lord wants to communicate to you in this time of need. Not that God is great. He is great. Not that God is holy. He is holy. Not that God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. No, those are great theological truths. But that's not what God wants to communicate to you right away. The very first thing that God wants to communicate to you in the midst of your hurt and in the midst of your concern is that He cares about you. He cares about you deeply. He cares more about the situation that you are in than you care about it. And He loves you and has empathy and compassion for you. And so that's why the next verses say, O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up on the high mountain, O Jerusalem. You who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up and do not be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold the Lord shall come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold his reward is with him, and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather his lambs with his arm. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. What does this all mean? You can personalize it to understand what it means. God is coming to you, verse 10, with a strong hand, not with a weak hand. He is able to deliver you. Number two, his arm shall rule for him. In other words, he will overrule any situation that you are facing now. The enemy may have his strategies against you, and the world may have beaten you down, but God has a bigger plan for you, and that is that you would rise up above your adversity and prosper and thrive in his name. He is overruling what you are experiencing now. His reward is with him. The Lord never puts you through something without rewarding you in the end. You may sow in tears tonight, but tomorrow morning you will reap with joy. How many people believe that? You may have to lay down your life for something and you may have to give up everything that you have, but tomorrow morning the Lord returns it to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. You never lose anything with God. Never. And his reward is coming with him. And his work is before him. He who began a good work in you shall complete it until the day of the coming of Christ Jesus. What he started in you, he will finish. You don't have to worry about how it's going to happen. You don't have to lose sleep at night. Whatever the plan of God is for your life, if you will look to him, he will complete it in his own strength. You don't have to do anything but believe. He's coming. And he's not coming with harshness. He's not coming to, to kick you out of your stupor or to shake you out of your complacency or to look at you face to face and grit his teeth at you and bear his teeth at you and, and, and say to you, get it together. I know sometimes we leaders feel that way. We feel like grabbing people by the throat and shaking them and saying, get it, get it together. But the Lord never does that. The Lord would never do that to somebody who is hurting. The Lord would never be harsh to somebody who is bleeding. The Lord would never shake up somebody who is in need. He's always tender. He's always kind. He's always merciful. I remember there's another passage in Isaiah that really moved me when I was going through something. The smoldering wick he will not snuff. And the bruised reed he will not break. That's important because when I am smoldering and when my light is ready to die, 
I know that the Lord won't come and in anger and in some kind of condemnation take his two fingers and snuff out my light, but no, he will cup his hands around my life to preserve me from the wind and my flame will begin to burn brightly again because the hands of God are around me and my flame, my life will rise again. I know that if I am bent over and weary and if the world has beaten me down and I am and I am limping and bruised and discouraged and hurt and my heart is bleeding, I know that the Lord will not come and break the stem of my life in half and say get it together. No, he will lift me up like a gentle gardener. He will prop me up. He will support me until my stock becomes strong again. Oh, hallelujah. And the fruit begins to develop again in my life. That's the tender, gentle, wonderful Jesus that we serve. And that's how he deals with the hurting. Come on, give him a clap offering today. He is a wonderful God. That's how he deals with the hurting. He will feed his flock like a shepherd and he will gather his lambs with his arm. When we're hurting, when we're in need, we, we have conceptions about what we need. And we may go running from here to there, trying to find answers. But the Lord is so good. He doesn't let us run too far. Like a shepherd, he gathers his sheep towards himself. And he points you into the direction that you need to go. You may feel that you need to go there and here and all over the place. But the arm of the shepherd curls around you and turns you from the wrong direction and points you to himself and he draws you into his bosom because that's where your need will be answered. Face to face in the bosom of the living God. So when I think about this, this image of a shepherd gathering his sheep, I, I, I see myself being gathered into his presence. I see all of you being gathered into his presence. I, I know that we get restless sometime and, and, and I know that, that, that we get frantic and we get into a panic. But isn't it wonderful to know that even in the, in the midst of our worst panic, in some way the Lord will gather us to himself and comfort us and speak gently to us and restore us and feed us. He will feed you. He will nourish you. He will strengthen you. He will pour into you exactly what you need so that you can be restored and you will feel full and you will overflow with power and strength because the living bread has come and nourished your soul. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's exciting, isn't it? And he will gently lead those who are with young. So what this says to me and what this says to you is that the, the delay the delay may testify that God doesn't care. But don't pay attention to the delay. His word declares that, is, that he cares deeply. The, 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 the fatigue that I feel may be projected onto God and I may feel that he's fatigued and weak too. But the word testifies that he ordains strength in my weakness and his strength is revealed in me especially when I am weak. The discouragement and disappointment may make me think that things will never change. But his word says that the suffering that I feel now, the suffering that I'm going through now cannot be compared with the glory that will be revealed when all this suffering is over and God has had his way. Don't look at the delay. Don't measure the suffering in your life. Don't conclude what God is doing by the pain that you feel. Understand that he works according to his word. And his word says he is faithful and he will show himself faithful. No matter how long you have endured the pain, it's going to end and God will come through. That's a promise of the word of God. God cares, and he will show himself strong in the weakness of my situation. I need to say that again. God cares, and he will show himself strong in the weakness of my situation. How strong is he? That's the next issue that Isaiah 40 deals with. Well, this was a big issue, as I had mentioned before, with the children of Israel, because they began to believe that he was not as strong as the gods of Babylon. And so Isaiah reminds them again of the power of God. 
And as I read these scriptures, I hope that you too will be reminded of the power of God. Listen to this. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Who has measured heaven with a span and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure? Weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor taught him? With whom did he take counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the paths of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the, na the nations are as a drop in a bucket and are counted as small dust on the scales. Look, he lifts up the isles as a very little thing and Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor its beasts sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing. They are counted by him as less than nothing and worthless. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare him to? The workman molds an image, the goldsmith overspreads it with gold, the silversmith casts silver chains. Whoever is too impoverished for such a contribution chooses a tree that will not rot. He seeks for himself a skillful workman to prepare a carved image that will not totter. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he, the Lord, who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain who spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Scarcely shall they be planted. Scarcely shall they be sown. Scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth. When he will also blow on them and they will wither. And the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. To whom will you liken me or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number who calls them all by name by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. God cares, and Isaiah through this last passage that I read reminds us that he is infinitely strong. And he reminds the children of Israel that the gods of Babylon are nothing but wood, gold, silver, smelted and fashioned by the hands of men. So how is it that these false gods seem to triumph over the living God? The answer is very simple. The nation had turned away from serving the living God and started to gravitate towards idols of wood and gold and silver. So it wasn't that the Babylonians were stronger than the God of Israel. It was that because the gods of, of the Babylonians were adopted by the children of Israel because they too began to worship idols that they found themselves in this precarious situation. And the Lord wanted to teach them that no, idols are not going to be your answer. I am your answer. A harsh lesson, but they did learn it. And so he says to you to lift up your eyes on high and to see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number, who calls them all by name, by the greatness of his power and the, the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. That applies to you. He knows you by name. He knows what you're going through. And not one of you is going to be lost. You're not going to be lost to the adversity. You're not going to be swallowed up by failure. You're not going to be ignored by the eyes of God. He will see you and he will lift you up and you will be counted and your legacy will remain. Not one of those he calls by name is missing. Man, if that's true about the stars, how much more true is it of you? He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear that falls and hears me when I call. He will hear, hear you. Now how does this apply personally, all of this stuff? The children of Israel are exiled and Isaiah has reminded them that God cares, that he is strong, that he is coming, that he's going to move every mountain and exalt every valley, that he has not forsaken them. But how does this apply to you and me now today? I'm sure that you're able to relate to the verses that are upcoming. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God? Have you ever felt that way? I know I have. I think it's time for us to be honest. Have you ever felt God is ignoring me? Can't he see what I'm going through? It's as if I'm hidden from his sight. I want to tell you that this is common in the Christian life. 
Now, I can't explain the delays of God. And no pastor can. Oh, we may have our ideas and we may have our standard cliche statements. Sometimes God says yes, sometimes God says no, and sometimes God says wait. That doesn't bring a lot of comfort to somebody who's been waiting for He delays. I don't have a clear understanding of why He allows a difficult situation to continue. When I get to heaven, I'm going to ask him, why is it that you exiled the Jews for 70 years to the Babylonians? Couldn't have been 10? Couldn't it have been 5? Couldn't you have gotten your point, point again uh, uh, across in 3? I might have to ask him, why, why, did you, why did you allow your people to be slaves in Egypt for 400 years? Couldn't it have been 10, 40, 50, 60, 100 years of slavery? That surely would have been enough. Why 4? Why 4? I don't know why God delays. I don't know why He's allowed your situation to go on and on and on and on. I, I, can't, I can't explain to you the dynamics of that. I, I can't give you a, a detailed account that would satisfy you. But one thing I know for sure. The delays all have a purpose. The delays all have a purpose. That I know. And I know that the ultimate purpose is that you would look to God as your ultimate source of strength and to no one else. That's what the delays are for. To bring you to the point where you seek Him alone and no one else. Delays have a way of killing trust, don't they? If they're going to kill trust at all, let them kill trust in your own wisdom. Let them kill trust in the wisdom of others. Let them kill trust in your own strength and your own ability to get things done because that's what the delays are for. And let your distrust of yourself compel you to seek the living God who is more than trustworthy and who delivers on every promise He makes. So let your trust gravitate away from men and from yourself onto Him. And when He has captured your heart in full because that's what the delay is for I know at least that much when your heart has completely been captivated by him and given over to him in total absolute trust forsaking trust in all and everything else the delay will end the delay will end and the situation will cease and you will be blessed if he were to speed up the process and lose you, what benefit would that have? If he gave you the desires of your heart and in the end you stopped worshipping him or you weren't as committed as you should be, what would be the purpose of, 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 of speeding the process up? He will never give you what will cause him to lose you. And sometimes that's why he delays. He delays until he knows he has you. And when he has you, then he can trust you with any blessing that he gives you and he knows that he will not lose you. I thought about an illustration once when I thought about God's process and delays. It's an illustration of a man who wanted to help a butterfly out of a cocoon. This caterpillar had closed itself up in a cocoon like all caterpillars do. And this man watched the cocoon develop and he decided to experiment. So before the time came when the cocoon was shed and the caterpillar emerged as a full butterfly, he decided to take a pair of scissors and snip open the cocoon so that the butterfly would, e would emerge a little quicker. He called it the merciful snip. What happens was, was is that the cater caterpillar had not fully developed into a butterfly and when he opened up the cocoon, the butterfly died. Had he waited until the cocoon had opened up naturally, we would have had another butterfly gracing and beautifying the surface of the earth. But the merciful snip destroyed the process of God. Inside all of us there is a desire for a merciful snip. 
That is, that somebody would come along and speed up the process that we are going through. That somehow the Lord will, will, will kind of not let us go through the process in full, but, but kind of hurry up, you know, and give us the blessing that we are seeking. Give us that breakthrough that we are looking for. Give us that job that we are seeking. Give us the money that we are desiring. Give us a partner in life that we crave. Uh, the things that we desire in this life, we're waiting and we're believing God, but they're not quick in coming, and, and we, we neglect the fact that character is being developed, and that our heart is being gravitated now towards the Lord, so we want a merciful snip, a merciful hurry up on the part of God. The same thing would happen to you that would happen to the butterfly that was given a merciful snip. Because you did not allow God to complete his process and you rushed ahead, you would die. And his purpose would not be fulfilled. And that's the best way I know to explain the delays of God. Don't look for a merciful snip. Let the Lord have his way completely and let the process perfect you and perfect your heart so that he can bless you abundantly and know that he will never lose you. Amen. God will intervene. And when he does, we will learn that he is faithful and he is able to deliver us from anything we might face. That is what he's going to demonstrate to you, that he is infinitely faithful. So don't give in to the circumstances, but trust the word of God. And then in the final verses from verses 28 to verse 31, which are my favorite verses in all of the Bible, I've lived my life according to these verses. The prophet Isaiah asks the question, where do you get your strength? Where does your strength come from? Boy, that's a great question. It really is. Because when we are facing adversity, we turn to what we believe is our strength. Some people believe that talking a lot is their strength. Some people are given over to worrying and being anxious and staying up late and griping and complaining and grumbling. Uh, some people feel that they've got to take matters into their own hands, so they run around all over town trying to rectify the situation because they believe in their own strength. Or they look to others or to uh, me, uh, women, men, mentors, colleagues, whatever. So Isaiah is asking us, where do you get your strength from? He wants you to know that there is a strength that doesn't break down. He wants you to know that there is a strength that never gets weary, that doesn't falter, that doesn't fail. And he wants you to remember that human strength, no matter how great it is, whether it's your strength or the strength of somebody outside of yourself that you may be looking up to, human strength always fails. Sooner or later, human strength gets tired. So if you're looking for strength that never fails, look to the Lord. And so he writes, have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. Thank God. Because I faint and I get weary. His understanding is unsearchable. That's good. Because sometimes my understanding sends me into panicked confusion. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. I remember a time in my life when I had no strength and I read that verse, I began to weep. Because it gave me hope. What it promises is that he will increase strength to those who have no might at all. So if your strength has been depleted, if you have reached the end of your rope, if you have exhausted everything you know and you've tried everything that you have tried before and everything has failed and there's nothing left, he promises he will come and he will increase your strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. I researched why Isaiah wrote that. He wrote that because he was thinking about 
young men who are sent to war. We send them to war 18, 19, 20, 21 in the prime of their life because they have strong bodies, because they can endure, because they can do what older men can't do. In fact, if you're an older man, they won't even enlist you in the army. And what Isaiah was saying was, you take the strongest men, the strongest young men of any society, of any village, of any town, take the strongest and the bravest and the brightest and the most handsome and the tallest and the most elegant and the most eloquent, you take those young men and you put them under adversity for a long period of time and you will see they will become weary, they shall faint, and they shall utterly fall. Even the strongest will faint if the pressure mounts against them to a degree of breaking. Even the youth shall falter and fail when the going gets tough and it's more than they can handle. So don't despise your weakness and don't be discouraged by your failure and don't be upset by the fact that you are in a downtime and don't be disturbed by your finiteness or your inability to pull yourself out of the pit. It doesn't matter. Because those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Wait on the Lord and you will become strong. Dwight, would you get ready to sing? I want to talk about waiting on the Lord just for a moment as Dwight prepares. And uh, if I could have somebody move my pulpit, Mark, could you take that out of here? Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to talk to you about what it means to wait on the Lord. I don't have to talk a long time because I've already told you. Waiting on the Lord is meeting with Him in the secret place. And waiting on Him is praising Him and honoring Him and spending time with Him and drawing strength from Him. That's the secret to strength in the Christian life. Waiting on the Lord. And the scripture says that if you wait on the Lord, you will renew your strength and you will mount up with wings like an eagle. When I first read that scripture verse many, many years ago, when I first got saved, I immediately understood the image. An eagle flies higher than any bird. And sometimes people in airplanes can see them flying right beside. It's incredible. But they don't flap their wings a lot. Eagles ride on the wind. And I've been told as I researched eagles that the older eagles, not the young ones, but the older ones, will sit on the top of a cliff and wait for the right wing to come, wind to come, before they stretch out their wings. And they'll wait and wait and wait, and just at the right time, when a hot wind blows, because they're experienced old eagles now, they know that a hot wind will take them up higher than a cold one. They'll stretch out their wings and barely move them and they'll be elevated up from the precipice into the heavens higher than the eye can possibly see. And I'm thinking to myself, well that's probably why God gave them such good eyes to be able to look down from the earth because you, you couldn't see an eagle up in the air but he can see you. Oh, he can see you. And he rides the wind without barely any effort at all. When I wait upon the Lord, I am like that eagle. And when I am in his presence, I am like that old eagle standing on the precipice of a cliff, waiting for the right wind to blow. Well, the right wind is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God. And when I sense that wind blowing, I stretch out my hands in worship and praise. And I am elevated by my God. Stronger and wiser and better and greater than I was before I went into his presence. And I've learned over the years to ride the wind of the Holy Spirit. And he's taken me to heights that are absolutely unbelievable. Well, one year, Mrs. Lapos and I went to Nassau. That's where all the uh, spaceships are, are set off. Cape Canaveral used to be called Cape Kennedy in those days. And I saw the most magnificent sight I've ever seen in my whole life. In fact, if you go down to Cape Canaveral at any time of the year, you will see this sight. Forty eagles. 
There's a gust of wind that blows in Cape Canaveral and a particular spot. And it continually blows all the time. And these eagles, <laughs> these eagles show up out of nowhere and they, they enter into the wind and like a carousel, they just soar around and around and there are eagles piled up all the way up like a high column and they are soaring all around 40 eagles all at once soaring in a circle riding this gust of wind in Cape Canaveral I looked at that and I said to myself man that's absolutely magnificent and you know what I was looking for? I was looking for one of them to flap their wings I stood there for 10 minutes watching those eagles go round and round and round not one of them ever flapped their wing even once they just rode the wind round and round and round and as the wind blew and as the gust became stronger all 40 eagles began to rise in the air without so much as flapping their wings I thought to myself this is a picture of the church this is an image of what Jesus wants for his church that when we go through adversity and when we go through a hard time that all of us together learn to ride the wind now you may be on the ground and you may be scuffling around trying to find an answer but come on up to where we are. Come on up to the body of Christ. Come on up to where your brothers and sisters are. And let us restore you into the wind. Let us restore you to the high places. Don't, don't search for answers on your own and in your own strength. But ride the wind with the people of God. And you're going to soar to heights. We'll all soar to heights together that we've never ever before imagined. And that is the transition and the bridge between our hurts and living victoriously in a godless society. If we're going to be victorious in a society that denies everything that we believe and, and vilifies all of our convictions, we're going to have to learn to ride the wind and soar higher. So high that even the ungodly will look at us and say, there must be a God. Look at how high those people are soaring. And that's where we're going next week. But for now, I pray that you'll wait upon the Lord because He cares for you and He will intervene. So let's just go over what the Scripture said if I can remember it. Number one, I want to speak comfort to you today. I want to tell you that God is coming. He is coming into your situation. Every mountain will be brought down. The mountains that stand in front of you that hinder you will be removed. Every valley will be exalted. You won't have to sink into the depths. He will make a straight highway. Not for you, but for himself. And he will come to you face to face and he will lift you up out of the miry clay and set you on a solid rock to stay. And when he comes, here's what he's going to do. He's not going to beat you into submission or kick you into service. No, he knows you're hurting. He knows you're tired. He knows you are hungry and thirsty. So the very first thing he's going to do is he's going to gather you together to himself. He's going to pull you into his bosom. He's going to direct you away from the answers that you are looking for out there and direct you to himself because he is your answer. And when you have seen him face to face, he will feed you with his spirit. He will feed you with his word. He will embrace you and he will pull you close to his bosom and you will be strengthened beyond your wildest imagination. And as he strengthens you, he will give you a revelation that the forces that are around you are not greater than your God. No. You may feel they are and in your fatigue and frustration, you may feel that God is helpless to do anything about your situation. But he will remind you that he is higher than the heavens, Amen. that he sets the planets in course, that he lifts up kings and he drops kings, that he builds and, and establishes kingdoms and in the next breath removes them, that he lifts up princes and then blows them away like dust to remind you that he is in total control of your life and you cannot be lost. You will not be lost because he knows you by name. And in the way, same way that he calls the stars out by name and not one of them is missing, neither will you be missing. You will not be lost in your pain and your suffering. He will see you and he will glorify himself in you and he will lift you up. And finally, I want to remind you that your strength comes from him and from no one else and that the, the, the delays of God are designed to gravitate you and to compel you to trust in him completely. Don't look for the merciful snip. Don't look for the process to be speeded up. Take advantage of the time that you have and do what Isaiah says in 
in the latter part of his passage, uh, chapter 40, to wait upon the Lord and your strength will be renewed like the eagle. Take time to wait upon God, to seek his face, to build yourself up spiritually. I was talking to somebody earlier this week and they were telling me, well, you know, I'm going to build up the other parts of my life and then think about the spiritual things. Well, that's the world's way and that, that may work for you to take care of your business and to take care of your financial affairs and to look to the things of this life. And then, then, when, you, then when everything is straight, you can look to God. But that's not God's way. God's way is to look to Him first and to establish relationship with Him first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things that you are working on and worrying about and losing sleep over and feeling bad about shall be...